So you make copies. Yeah, I make copies, and then I'm gonna find this. I'm gonna find the you sir, I'm good, sir. How are you doing? All right. Just for uh, a second, yeah. I really want okay. to tell him this one. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, because we have this supplement, whatever she wants. Yeah, that's where you guys might tag team. We need to be reporting. I guess there's this new thing. We do a Zoom. Yeah, I think so. We do report all of ours. And we do pay for all of So you're good. I would do this for you. That that young lady in the back. No, the guy. Oh, the guy that's hard to move. Yeah, the only guy I'm going to show you later. Yeah, okay. Are you shooting out there? Up a little bit, or depends on the day you ask. Like, I got to get ready for a couple. But in the commercial business, which is mainly my pastime, uh, it's really not Really? It's like about 1 30. Well, you know, I'm probably yelling at her coming after me. So she'll probably drop by about six up. I hope her, and he has to come after you. We were sequencing. That was perfect. You want a snow cone bottle, Larry? Absolutely. All right. They have, uh, what flavor? Uh, Carlo, what flavors do you have? Yeah. Oh, no. I, I thought you were just kidding. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Andrew, how are you doing? I'm good, sir. How are you? Sure. So you like took the whole day off for your birthday? Right here? <laughs> oh, wow. Celebrate so the uh, birthday. Wow. Wow. Oh, that would be this. Oh, I didn't do it on Saturday, too. It was, uh, I was a little dehydrated. Yeah. I one of those that passed the snow in already. Oh, yeah. You have to. Yeah, no, I'm going to look at the title. It's not what he's following. They're probably doing okay. But, you know, it's not what he's following. They had a beer what you might call a normal market. Whatever that you kind of forgot something. I know. It's really um, I was just talking to uh, one of our chocolate chicks. She had a quick cheddar box. I was sharing one closing in black, but in August, she just did her six. Said six patients, and and her books are really bingy for for uh, really yeah. I don't know. Same time, I've got other things So, seems to be no rhyme reason. She was telling me that. Yeah, uh, County, somewhere out the middle of nowhere. Uh, I had one in East Texas getting another call today. So, picking up and doing wire and ranch to guys out there. Yeah, because agents are kind of unfamiliar with that. Kind of those concepts, and so they want an attorney riding a shotgun. Sure. Uh, and one lady, uh, she's representing some buyers. There are lots of oil wells. She's really terrified of those issues. They helped her with Do you like some water or something? All right. I just had lunch. My house is like right here, so I made a pit stop there. You're going to have some lunch, take a nap. No, I just get my mouth. So we're good. Um, 
Uh, we have Carla here who helps putting all the good stuff in the back here, and we greatly appreciate her. She, you know, just happy and so forth. Um, and Charles has agreed to come and talk about an issue that we continue to have challenges with. Uh, he was just reminding me that one of the reasons that we have challenges, do we have the Zoom thing going? I don't see yeah, it. I think it's yeah, coming. Make sure we yeah. see the yeah. Zoom challenges, party yeah. challenges. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, great. Um, is it because we're dealing with a seller right up front? Uh, we don't have as much information later as the title company has because they're seeing after bid search and all those kinds of things. But it's really important that. Um, from our perspective, the listing agreement is done correctly, the contract's done correctly, because there's a whole lot of different circumstances for sellers. Um, one of the things that I, I sometimes said in a joking manner, but I'm deadly serious. When you go out and you talk to a, a quote unquote seller on a listing, you almost need to say to them, what makes you think you own this property and have a right to sell it? You almost need to say that. Because not all of them do. Not all of them understand their rights or their authority as they work through all that. Uh, so it's it's really, uh, really key as we work through it. But he's going to talk about the different scenarios. And you saw in my email that I sent out to you, you got all kinds of different scenarios from trustees and administrators and executors and all those kinds of things. And what we need to do is we need to understand in each of those types of situation, uh, what do we call those people? Like, do we put the name of the trust in paragraph one? You know, what, what do we do with all that as we work through it? How do they sign it? Uh, what's the process we go through to make sure they do have some authorities and we work through that? Because if we don't get those things right, not only does it affect the enforceability of the listing agreement, it could affect the enforceability of the contract, which is not fair and not right to the client and to the people on the other side. We don't want to represent that, that we represent a seller who can convey title to a buyer who's going to spend all this time, energy, money thinking they're about to buy a house and then it turns out they can't because the person they thought they were dealing with is not the real person. So we greatly appreciate Charles coming in and because he, he gets to see all these situations over and over and over again all the time. Um, and so he's going to give you some information. And like in all my classes, uh, we encourage questions. As you go through this, uh, kind of keep it on the topic as you work through it. But because uh, in real estate, before you know what you're talking about, your next door neighbor's barber has a house in Alabama. <laughs> so, please can't go there. so, Charles, Charles okay. Kramer, please. Uh, sure. Uh, I would like to give everyone my phone number. So, if you have questions after this class, not only about this particular topic, but about anything else in the world of real estate, feel free to call me, regardless of where you close. My name again is Charles Kramer with a K. My phone number is 214-387-4591. And my cell, which 20 years ago I didn't used to give out, but now where times are different, uh, 214-766-0151. My office phone is best eight to five. My cell is best weekends and evenings. So. I know you guys don't stop 5.30 on Friday, so feel free to call me. Now. So I want to ask, are we going to talk, do we want to focus on contract parties, listing agreement parties, or both? What, what do we want to kind of focus I'd on? I'd like for us to talk about both because, first of all, we take a listing. Uh, it's important. If we're going to take on this listing, spend time, energy, money on this, we need to know it's enforceable. We know that we're talking to the right person here who not only has the authority to sell a house, but we're looking to to pay our commission. Yeah. Uh, and I don't mean to be totally self-centered, but that's that's what we're doing. And we need to make sure it's legitimate. Okay, let's let's focus on the listing then. You you have a property, presumably someone is coming to you that you haven't forced your way into their home and say, here, sign this, and they're a complete stranger. They they have sought you out in some manner. And I think that the natural thing for most agents to do is to look at the tax rolls. You know, who is this owner? And you're gonna get a name. And so this person in front of you is presumably one of the owners of the property. There may be multiple, but the tax roll is obviously the first place you look. Now, 
I hate to go to a topic that Bob wanted at the end, but if, if, I might as well touch on something before I forget about it. In case you're not aware, we are going through a time of, I'll call it a wildfire of seller raw land fraud. And just for public title, I, don't, I couldn't even quote the statistics for all the title companies in the Dallas Fort Worth area. It's happening all over the state. There are people that are calling agents saying they own some land, they want to sell it, and the excited agent wants to sign them up. Well, in this world of DocuSign and email and telephone, it's quite possible that the person who claims they own the land never sits in front of you face to face. And I'm not going to dare suggest that you can't do a listing with someone face to face uh, or, you, or that that's the only way to do it. But if they are local, that might be the first thing to making sure that you don't get embarrassed or caught into a fraud is to say, can you meet me? Okay. If they're calling you from Kansas, if they're calling you from Canada, that's a different matter. But if they are local, say, can you meet? And I think that's, it's important that you see them face to face and say, I'll come to you. We can meet at the Starbucks. We can meet at the, you know, at the site. I'd like to see the property. Those, so kind of the first thing I would do is push the person that's, that's attempting to contact you. Try and meet them face to face. Second, if you've never met them before, and again, subject to what Mike and Bob want to establish for the company in terms of policies and procedures. But I think it is uh, a good measure of commercial prudence to ask for ID and even make a copy of it for your file. Say, okay, I need to get, you know, it's, it's my procedure to get a copy of the ID. Can I see your ID? And you ask for that. If you are Meeting a seller who is long distance, let's say they are in Kansas or Canada or somewhere else, then ask for a Zoom meeting. Say, can I, can we talk via Zoom this evening? And then you have your Zoom interview and you're going to talk to them. And why not ask for the ID during the Zoom meeting? Say, can I see your ID? You know, just because I want to make sure that we protect you and keep you safe. We need to make sure your ID matches the name on the tax rolls. And so that's, a, that's another thing. If you want to be super, super prudent, because believe it or not, Republic Title has caught deals in which the fraudulent seller has a fake ID and has presented a fake ID to the agent, fake ID to the title company. You can do what the title companies are doing now and say, I need two forms of ID. Most fraudsters will think to copy, you know, they'll get a, a fake ID, but they won't have a second form of ID. So I'll I'll leave that up to you. But um, my my suggested tips for reducing seller fraud when you're talking to a complete stranger about the sale of land is to one, try and meet them face to face, two, ask for their ID and get a copy of it, uh, three, do a Zoom meeting where they present the ID if they're long distance, um, and four, ask for a second form of ID if you can do that there. If you have a owner of land that absolutely refuses to meet you in person, that cannot meet you for a Zoom meeting, that cannot do anything but send you emails that seem to arrive at three o'clock in the morning, that is someone that you should stop talking to, <laughs> okay? They are not real. It's, it's, a, it's an illusion, it's bait. They're trying to get you to bite the book. Now, who should sign the listing? So you're, you look at the tax rolls, you look at a name, one of the questions I get just in terms of human beings, well, if they're, if it's a married couple, do both spouses have to be on my listing? The question is not necessarily, the answer is not necessarily, but remember your listing is the one you enforce it against. So if you only have one of two people, one of two owners on your listing, and you only have one of two owners okay. on your Okay, so spouse, I don't think there's any reason for me to tell no. anyone. Oh, no, there's not. Pauline, uh, mute. Mute yourself. Thank you. All right. <laughs> if you only have one of two owners on a, on a contract or a listing, that doesn't mean that you have an invalid listing or an invalid contract. It means that you need the cooperation of a party who's not bound in any way. You can't make them sell. You can't make them pay you a commission. You can't make them sign a contract. So that's why it is important to get all owners, and if it is homestead, if it's their residence, get their spouses. They're going to have to sign your, your listing agreement and your contract. Let's move away a little bit. We may come back to it. Uh, 
to humans, but let's talk about entities. Let's talk, you mentioned, uh, well, let's, let's talk about deceased humans, okay? Let's say that there are two people on the tax rolls and you meet with one of them and you ask about the other person, say, that's my wife or that's my husband and they died, they're deceased. Now you have a question of, well, does this person I'm talking to have the sole, are they the sole owner? What happened to the dead person's interest? What happened to their title? Does it automatically go to the spouse? Not necessarily. So you need to ask them that question. Okay, so where, you know, your, I show your spouse in Title II under the tax rolls there. Did you go to probate? Did you probate their will? Oh. If the deceased person didn't have a will or they didn't probate the will, then their title has passed to someone. It might be the surviving spouse. It might be someone else. And at that point, you may need to say, you know, I need to get some help. We may need to call Kelly or Charles and get some analysis as to who the heirs are. Uh, it might be you, but I want to make sure that we are lassoing in. Maybe that's not a great word to use, but we are collecting all of the, the necessary people that need to sign this agreement. I need to be sure that you are the heir. If, for example... The surviving spouse was married to the deceased spouse, and the deceased, the deceased spouse who did not have a will had children with someone else, a very common situation. That surviving spouse does not inherit that community property house. The deceased spouse's interest passes to those kids. And so you may have signed up the surviving spouse to your listing, signed the surviving spouse to your contract, and, and will discover rudely or surprisingly, that uh, there's there's three kids from the deceased spouse's prior marriage that own half the title. What? Now you're in a pickle. So it's good to lasso, if you will, the correct people at the very beginning. And so let me interrupt. Dead right. owners are really tough. Okay, so this is not just a CYA thing, not just a liability thing. This is best service. I mean, the seller who wants to sell the property. Have some valid reason for doing that. I need to know the right way to do it. We need to not put buyers at risk who think they can buy this house and move in. When in fact they can't because we haven't done our job on this side. So it's it, it's important at a high level of service that we go through this process and understand it. It's not just to see why kind of thing. Sally. So I have a question: When you have a um, two sellers and you're under a listing agreement and the house is under contract and one of the sellers. Dies during the contract pendency. Contract pending. Okay. That does not blow away the contract or destroy the contract. That contract is still one, it's binding against the living seller. And the law says it's binding against the dead seller's estate. If the if the buyer really wants to go that way, you know, they that you don't get out of a contract and your heirs don't get out of a contract simply by you dying. So the, the, the contract obligations pass to the estate, and so, who those people are is to be determined. So do you have to stop everything and have, if they have a will, provide the will? before? There's a, there's a lot of maybes and depends, okay? There's, there's two basic ways to pass title when you die. One is it goes straight to your heirs, whoever that class of people may be. You don't have to probate. You have to determine who those heirs are, and you generally have to create an affidavit sworn by two people that don't inherit or benefit that sets forth who the heirs are, okay? That's called intestate succession. There's laws on the books that say what class of people inherit the property. That's fast. The other way, however, is probate. Probate occurs when you go to a court of law and you basically say to the court, I want to be put in charge over this estate and be the point person to run it and have power over this deceased person's property. That might be the same person who inherits under the will, but it's generally put me in charge, okay? Probate takes a little longer. Now, here's the interesting thing most people aren't aware of. <clears throat> if you have a will and you don't probate in a probate court, it's as if you don't have a will and your property would pass the other way by intestate succession. So remember this folks, a will is not effective unless and until probated. Prize. So when someone comes to you and says, 
my wife died. Um, I'm their executor and I have the power to sell the property. You should go, you know, Charles talked about probate in that class. He said, you've actually got to go to court. So the thing that you would ask for in reflexive response to that statement is you're the executor. Great. I need to see the court order sometimes called the letters testamentary to show that you are executor, that you were appointed as executor. And you may, in saying that, find out some interesting facts like, well, I was named as executor in his will. Did you probate the will? No. Then I'm here to tell you that you're not legally anything. You're not an executor. You're not an executor until the court appoints you as executor. Question. Would a right of survivorship? Would a right of survivorship what? A, uh... The vice president going to probate? Maybe. Some, a right of survivorship is a contractual way of passing property at your death, where two owners, maybe husband and wife or maybe not married, agree that upon the death of one co-owner, the property automatically passes to the other. Sometimes those work. Sometimes they don't. They're often very poorly done. I often see deeds into Charles and Britt Kramer, comma, as joint tenants with right of survivorship. And the survivorship, the joint tenancy, as we say, fails because Charles and Britt, who are grantees, never signed the deed. The law requires that there be a written agreement between the joint tenants. And just being a grantee on a deed, buyers don't sign deeds. So joint tenancy is, is a possibility and title might pass to the joint tenancy, but it's gonna take a little more legal analysis. So when you get into these, these death situations where you're talking to a survivor and you're listing their property, you may need some help. I don't expect you guys to walk away from this class and know a state and probate law like the back of your hand and be able to analyze every different situation perfectly. You're gonna need a little assistance and, and we're here to help you. We will help you run the analysis. It may involve you going back to answer more questions. And we run the analysis and we go, well, based on what we've got, Here's who I think owns the property. And that's a preliminary analysis. But it's 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 important for you guys to realize that these are just not automatic things that, as Bob said, you have the hardest job of all. You're on the front end. You're dealing with a surviving spouse, for example, and you don't know all of the details like the title company does that's examined a probate or asked all the questions. And did they die on the property? And when? Because that may create a challenge for us in dealing with death on a property. We got one right now, fortunately not here, in Rockwall, in which we're, we're dealing with someone who has been appointed by the court from the deceased spouse who was killed by her husband. He's in prison now, and she's dead, and the court appointed her son as an administrator, temporary administrator, whatever they called it deal with it. So you have all kinds of situations. And, and it, it's, it's, I know it's tragic, but when I discovered this situation, my first immediate response or question was, was she killed on the property? That's a violent death. It has to be disclosed. So have to deal with that. If you're in a deceased owner situation, let's, let's get some big picture takeaways here. One, I think you should ask, did they have a will? And if the answer is yes, Say, can I get a copy of the will? And if they had a will, your next question is, have you gone to probate court on that will? And if the answer to that is yes, then your last question is, do you have a copy of the court order admitting this will to probate? You get all that stuff gathered in your file, you're going to cut short the title company's work in having to hire an independent company to, re to retrieve this stuff by as much as five or 10 days. You're going to shorten your timeline and make your clothing closing smoother. There. Yes. Um, just to go back to clarify something, you were talking about a husband and wife mm -hmm. own the house, mm -hmm. but there was children from previous marriage. Correct. So the hus maybe the husband owned the house and remarried the wife, and the wife does not own the house. Is that the situation? No, the situation I'm describing. Yeah. Title goes into a husband and wife. Husband and wife are married. Yes. They buy a house together. Okay. Num so number one is community property right. because the title incepts during marriage. One of those two dies. Pick one. Who do you want to victimize? You know? um, the wife. Or the wife I'm dies. Be nice. <laughs> wife dies. Okay. And let's pretend we don't have a will. 
or the will has not been probated. And you discover that husband and wife who bought the house have no kids. The wife had kids with someone else, either a prior husband or maybe she just had kids. You don't have to be married to have kids. Let's say there's three of them, okay? <clears throat> so the law says in the absence of a will or a probate, remember, same thing, community property is split in half. The surviving spouse keeps their one half, the one half of the husband, who did we who did we say died? Did I mix this up? The wife died. The wife died. So the husband keeps his one half. The wife's one half does not pass to the surviving spouse. Okay. It goes to her kids because the law kind of creates an intelligent presumption. We're not going to presume that stepdad is going to take care of her kids. Okay. So they get half the title. That is a very, Kelly can tell you, we've run into that 6,000 times over 30 years. We see it all the time. Why? Because people don't have wills, because people don't probate wills, and because people have multiple marriages and stepchildren. So it's a very common situation. If you, by the way, are alive and you want to avoid your property passing to heirs that you don't intend, go out and get a will so that you can have it probated after your death and have your property pass exactly the way you want. If you don't want to do a will, you can hire someone to do a trust. We're going to talk about those. Or a joint tenancy with rider survivorship. Or a TOD, a transfer on death deed, which is not really a deed, but works kind of like a POD bank account. It's kind of wild. But there's all sorts of ways to deal with how your title passes at your death. There. Thank you. Question. Okay, back to your under contract. And one of the oh, we didn't really go into this the mechanics of it. You're right. All right. So we have a husband and wife, you want to say, and one of them dies after they sign the contract. Mm -hmm. The title company and the agents will pause and they will ask their and the agents will ask their respective clients, what do you want to do? That's the first question. If the we're talking about a seller, one of whom has died. So if the surviving spouse says, I just can't go through with this. I, I got too much to deal with. I don't want to sell this house. Then you are going to carry that message to the buyer and say, they don't want to sell. Can we mutually terminate this contract and give you your earnest money back? You might even offer the option, even though the option is not supposed to be refundable, but just as a good faith gesture. And maybe that works. And maybe it doesn't. I'd say it works eight times out of 10 that, that many buyers who see this situation have a little bit of heart. And when the seller says, I don't think, they don't think the seller is jerking them around or trying to get out of the deal. They, they feel for the seller. But every once in a while, you've got a buyer who is desperate or determined or whatever adjective you want to use, who says, I'm really sorry. I, I am sorry for your loss. We still want to buy the house. And so now we have a situation and the title company, Kelly's just standing on the sidelines going, you know, y'all figure out what you, we can close only those people who are willing participants. So if seller doesn't want to sell and buyer wants to buy, where will that end up? I suppose the buyer can get a lawyer and come after the seller in the seller's estate and, and say, we're going to force you to sell specific performance. The law says it's binding on your heirs, successors, and assigns. So get ready for a court fight if you don't, if you don't do that. We don't see that. We typically don't see that happen very often, but it theoretically could happen. Now, sometimes the seller will go the opposite direction and the seller will say, I need to sell this house. I need to get through this deal. How can I sell the house? My husband has died. And then your seller client, surviving spouse, can work with Kelly and Charles and all the fine attorneys at Republic Title and say, where did title go? Where did that person's title go? Maybe it went to the surviving spouse. We do a simple affidavit of heirship and we close. Maybe the will has to be probated for estate tax or other tax reasons, and we need to delay closing six weeks. We don't know, but we can help you with that situation if that's the route of the decision tree that they want to go down. That answer, hopefully, that question there. It's, it's a mess when, when people die in the middle of a contract. But the, the short answer is most of the time, it kind of falls apart because the the grieving seller or grieving buyer. You know, you could have a husband and wife buyer and one of them dies and they say, now is not the right time to buy a house and they back out and the contract usually splits apart. The first money goes back to the buyer and they, they go on their way. But just so you know the law, the law is it's enforceable if you want to be tough. Against the so the beginning, you need to ask your client. How you feel? 
Yeah, okay. Is everything good? Uh, I need to know, this is the most important question. If you die, <laughs> what does your spouse want to do? <laughs> you don't say. All right. Let's talk a little bit about trusts, because it's a very common thing for people to put their real estate in a trust. And you'll go on the tax rolls and you'll see the Charles Kramer Trust, the Kelly Wall Trust, whatever. First thing that will surprise many, many people. Even though we talk about trusts as being a thing, the trust is going to do this. The trust is going to do that. The trust owns the property. That's actually a legal misnomer. The trust is not considered an entity under Texas law. It is not a thing. And so while it is very, very common, in fact, I would say I see it 99.8% of the time, for a seller line on paragraph one to say the so-and-so trust as the seller, that is legally inaccurate. Trust is not a thing. If you want to be precise and legal and most of all enforceable, then the line should always read person's name, put that in brackets, comma, trustee of the so-and-so trust. That is legally binding. Contracts are entered into with trustees, not trusts, because trusts are not an entity. And by comparison, if you really want to get into the details, states are the same way. The estate of Charles Kramer is not a legal entity, but Bill Kramer, comma, independent executor of Charles Kramer's estate, is a valid party to a contract. So same thing. Estates are bound up contractually by their representatives, which are typically executors, and trusts are bound up contractually by their trustees. So try and remember to have a, have a name, comma, trustee. That's why when you hear the term land trust, you see title companies and attorneys freaking out because in Texas, the land trust concept where a trust as an entity owns the real estate, there's no trustee named, doesn't work under Texas law. It works in Illinois, it works in other states, but we don't recognize land trusts. Uh, we just had a case that was so earth shattering that the legislature met to fix the law. We had a we had a case where title was deeded by deed into say the Charles Kramer Trust. And a year or two after closing, someone wanted to say that that deed was invalid, that the trust never took title and therefore this creditor of the seller could seize the property and have their judgment attached. It went all the way to the Texas Supreme Court who said a deed into a trust without naming a trustee is not only a nullity, it doesn't exist, it cannot even be corrected. That was the astounding thing. You can't do a correction deed to a void instrument. And it freaked the title business out. It's like, oh my God, you know how many deeds are out there that say the so-and-so trust? So we had to change the law in the legislature to allow us to correct those instruments there. So if you take away anything about dealing with trusts, either as a buyer or a seller, always put the name of the trustee, put a comma, put trustee, and then put the name of the trust. So similar to the will, we, we would need to see a copy of You're going to need to see a copy of the trust, because who's going to want to see it from you? The title company. The title company is going to want to see it either as a buyer or a seller. So ask for a copy of the trust. Now, this is really funny to me. Maybe I just don't understand privacy or I don't have as big appreciation of privacy. Some people are very touchy about their trust and they don't want you to see it. That's a private instrument. Of course it is. It's not recorded and they are loath to give it to you, even though Republic Title has seen and reviewed the trusts of the, of the wealthiest billionaires in Dallas, the Perot's and the Hunt's and the Bass's. They've seen all their trust things, but... Osh Lagel, you know, is not going to give her trust because it's a private thing. So if you get pushback on requesting the trust, then your fallback is to say, have you got, I think it's called a certificate of trust or an abstract of trust. There's a, it's a little two-page summary. See if you can get that because the title companies can often rely on that sort of thing. And if it's old, we can bootstrap it by having them at closing say this thing done in 2014 is still true and correct as of today. They can so, but you need something. You need to say, okay, it's in a trust. I'm going to need a copy of the trust. So let's get that for my file. Follow me so far. Corporate entities. 
such as limited liability companies, corporations. I'll include limited partnerships, but let's just, the LLC is probably the favored corporate vehicle for holding real estate and usually investment real estate. You don't typically put your homestead in an LLC because it makes it really hard to uh, get that homestead exemption there. But if you have a rent house, you know, you, one of the things you want to do is you want to have it owned by an LLC for liability protection so that it is the defendant in any lawsuit. And you want to have good liability insurance. We call that belt and suspenders. You want to have both belt and your suspenders on for liability protection. So who runs the LLC? When you're, when you're looking at a tax roll and it says the, the Bob Baker Limited Liability Company as the record owner, who signs your, your deal? You're gonna need to you're gonna need to look at the LLC documents to see who made it. Maybe you need to turn yourself on mute. Yeah, don't worry, zoom, zoom cut. Uh and you um right, mute yourself, mute. I'm reaching all sorts of confidentiality. We don't hear it. Don't take care of that here, just all right. Um LLCs. LLCs can either be run by and signed on behalf of a manager, which might be the equivalent of president or CEO. You can have one or more managers. You either have a manager run LLC or sometimes you have something called a member run LLC where the LLC doesn't have a manager. It says, look, it's just run by the members, kind of like a partnership. It's going to be hard for you to tell which. And if you're not sure, ask for a copy of their organizational documents, their LLC documents, and say, let's have a title company help us. We'll determine who needs to sign. And you, you get a copy of their LLC docs, or sometimes you give me the name of the LLC, and I go look it up on the Texas Secretary of State, and I'll say, the manager of this LLC, according to the records of the Texas Secretary of State, is Bob Baker. So your, your listing agreement and the contract need to be signed. You're going to list the LLC in line one, but the signature line is going to read Bob Baker Enterprises LLC by Bob Baker Manager or Bob Baker Managing Member, one of those two. He's going to sign on behalf of the LLC. Um, I didn't bring a notepad, but the way that you uh, do a corporate signature block can probably be kind of challenging. I don't know how do you handle that in zip forms when you want to when you want to do it. You just have the seller be the entity, and then you have the, the DocuSign signature up above it. Is that how it typically the works? Individual has to sign. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it's going to be. If you can, I don't know if DocuSign lets you do this, but if you could, in the signature block, say Bob Baker, comma manager, if you can fit all that in there, then it would be very hey, nice. Are DocuSign experts here? I don't know. Can you? Is that how you do that, <laughs> DocuSign? Yeah. All right. Yeah. But an LLC is named as the entity in, in block one of the contract, and it is signed for by a human. And the human that runs an LLC is either called a manager or a managing member. You may need a little help. We'll be glad to help you there. Corporations, same thing. But who runs a corporation? Typically a president. Sometimes a vice president has authority to sign. Uh, just depends. And the title company will kind of supplement that work on the back end just before closing, they're going to go to this entity and say, we need a, we need a resolution that confirms that the person who signed the contract has authority to convey the property by deed. And we prepare all that and they sign it and they kind of, we, we clean it up in a way. Any questions so far? Pretty good. Because we, we have a lot of the LLCs investor wise. Um, very common way to, you know. So just, on, on paragraph one, we have the name of the seller. And the LLC. Is owned by an LLC. What are we putting? You're going to put the name of the LLC. And Texas law requires that that be suffixed with either the word, either the phrase LLC, or you sometimes see LC. It's kind of weird. Or L dot L dot C dot. Um, I think those are all the variants. Just like a Texas corporation is required to be suffixed with either the word company or ink or co. 
something that will tell you it's one of those entities there. So that's that's if you really want to be truly legal and thorough, you would put Bob Baker Enterprises, comma, a Texas limited liability company, which would tell the world and the title company, go to the Secretary of the State of Texas to look up the foreign stuff. Whether you, Bob had a question in his email or, or a query, it's like, what if you can't fit all of that? What if the name of the LLC is, you know, 10 words long and, you, and the physical limitations don't let you do that? There's different ways to handle that. I think you might say C signature addendum, and then you would create an addendum to the contract that, that lays forth the full and complete legal name of the seller or the buyer. You know, when we when we get into the nitty gritty or the how, how do I wrangle doc, you know, DocuSign, how do I wrangle zip forms? My legal knowledge is of less use. That's that's a demon that you guys. But don't try to scrunch it in paragraph one. I mean, literally, go to another piece of paper and list it in paragraph twenty-two, or just all exhibits, and make sure you do that so it's clear. This is the seller. By the way, same thing on the buyer, and especially if you've got like seven or eight brothers and sisters who won't let some of them be an attorney, power attorney, and they've all are going to be in the title and go to a separate piece of paper. I don't try to scrunch it in there. Limited partnerships. They sometimes own real estate, especially commercial real estate. A limited partnership is one in which there are at least two partners. One we call a general partner who runs the limited partnership. And so remember, your general partner is the one that's going to sign on behalf of a limited partnership. And that general partner might be a human or it might be another entity. And it usually is another entity. And then there is a limited partner. And in the classic limited partnership setup, the general partner is there to absorb the liability and not really make any money. So you'll see limited partnerships on the on the exhibit A page that shows their share. They'll say general partner has a 1% share of the profits and losses. And the limited partners have a 99% share because they're the, the limited partners are the investors. They don't have any control, they don't have any say, they just get to share in profits and losses. So you'll usually see 99 or even sometimes 99.9% .9 split among one or more limited partners. But at its core, a limited partnership is going to always have a general partner and a limited partner. An investor partner, there's a limited partner. The general partner runs the show. So when you have a limited partnership, the thing or person that's going to sign on behalf of that limited partnership is always the general partner. You need to find out who is the general partner or what is the general partner. If the general partner of the limited partnership is itself an LLC, let's say, then you're going to have a you're going to have a complicated signature block. You might need our help. Charles Kramer Enterprises, comma LTD, a Texas limited partnership by Charles Kramer General Partner, comma LLC, a Texas limited liability company by Charles Kramer Manager. That's a three level signature block. That's the way. We do it at the title company. That's the way we do it in the law firm. And and uh, some people are complicated. You got to deal with the complexities of your client. Powers of attorney. Want to talk about that? Yep. First rule to know, a power of attorney ceases to be of any force and effect the second that the principal, the guy or woman, the person who gives the power to sign their name, dies. You cannot use a power of attorney after death. So if you're talking about a deceased owner, we're going to have to talk about intestate succession, affidavit of heirship, probate wills. We're going to have to go into that analysis there. Can't use a power of attorney. Powers of attorney are for living people. You will want, you're going to have to get a copy of it. And you're going to have to get the title company to look at it and approve it. Because believe it or not, sometimes you have clients and customers that have powers of attorney that the title company says, this is filled out wrong. I saw one today. It was supposed to be initialed by the principal. She didn't initial anything. She's gonna have to do a new one somehow. I'm not sure how we're gonna get through this here, but you're gonna need to get it approved. But generally the power of attorney allows the agent, and I use that in a very generic sense, I don't mean real estate agent, but the agent gets to sign on behalf of the principal. The principal is the person who gives the power. The agent is the party that receives the power. You get to sign their name. 
So if I give my power of attorney to Kelly, then she can literally take the contract and write in her handwriting, Charles Crank. She signs my name for me and binds me. Now, what Kelly might want to do, and it is recommended, and you can, you can call us if you need help with the signature block, is to indicate that it's not really Charles signing it. It's Kelly signing on behalf of it. So it might say, although it says Charles Kramer, it might say comma by Kelly Wald, agent and attorney, in fact. Or sometimes you even see, see by Kelly Wald, comma POA. They're just indicators that that signature is in a representative capacity. And that's how you do that. But the name in paragraph one the owner of the property doesn't change with a power of attorney. A power, is just, a power of attorney is just the ability to sign someone else's name. The ownership doesn't change. So if title is in Charles, then they're going to be listed in paragraph one. The signature might be by Kelly on page nine or 11 or whatever it is now, but the name will stay the same. Then will they say in their power of attorney? You could, if you wanted to be, if you've got the room and you want to be super precise in paragraph one, you could put Charles Kramer, comma, by Kelly Wall, his attorney, in fact. If you can squeeze all that in there, then, then they'll know right from the get-go on page one that the seller is not really signing. It's someone else through power of attorney. But they're also going to see that on the signature block, too. So you're going to be signing the person who did the power of attorney, sign their name, Correct. And then, and then it's some sort of designation yeah. by Bob Baker, comma, POA, something like that. But Bob won't sign his own name. He will sign the principal's name. That's how it's done. And whether DocuSign lets you set it up that way or how what their are limitations, I don't know. But remember that the signatory party is going to be the actual seller or actual buyer, the principal, not the agent. All right, what is what is left to cover? Well, let's talk about, is there anything that you got to look at when it's just one person's name? Uh, do you want to make sure that's the only person with interest? Uh, you know, you, you see- Maybe we'll talk about, do you want to talk about divorcing sellers? Yeah, divorcing, divorcing buyers? Sure. Okay, let's talk about that. For those of you that remember English, any word that ends in ING running, divorcing or whatever is called a gerund. So I'm always interested in the gerund form of divorce. A divorcing seller or a divorcing buyer is a married person. Texas has a very black and white view of marriage and divorce. And although we sometimes throw around the word legal separation, in Texas at least, um, there is only physical separation or emotional separation. There is no legal separation. You're just married might be out of the house, uh, but you're this weird. So until that person is divorced by signed order of the judge, they are married. And as a consequence, marital property laws and homestead laws often have the other spouse having to participate in your closing, especially if it's homestead, either homestead for the seller or homestead or intended homestead for the buyer. That spouse of a divorcing buyer is gonna to have to sign one document, which is the deed of trust. They're gonna to have to consent in writing to the lien being on the future homestead of that spouse. So sometimes that's problematic. Uh, when your client presents themselves as I'm divorcing, or I'm almost divorced, or terms of that effect, and you need to think, hey, you're still married. And you need to maybe talk to Kelly, or talk to me, or talk to Scott Rooker, or any of the other attorneys, to say, here are my facts. Are we going to have to, this spouse we do not want to evolve, what are we, we going to have to do? We can do an analysis. In some cases, if the lender is cool, we don't have to have their signature. There is some law that we have begun using in the last five or 10 years to avoid spousal joinder on purchase money loans. But still, I want you to remember the general rule that if you're married, your spouse is probably going to have to sign at least one document, either the mortgage instrument, the deed of trust if you're a borrower, or the deed if you're a seller. Question. 
Unfortunately, I ask these questions because I have these happening at the moment. <laughs> so I have another contract where we have the divorcing colors. Okay. What happens if that divorce goes through before we close the transaction? Well, then the title company can take a fresh look at the title. You know, one of the things they can do is just shake their head and go, let's look at it again. Oh, I, here's the divorce decree. It says the wife gets all the property. It's signed by the husband and wife. It's signed by the judge. We're good to go. Let's change our vesting on our title work to just the wife. Now, there is this, all trials, all lawsuits, and a divorce is still a lawsuit, have a period of 30 days after the judge signs the order to be appealed. But if we see it's an agreed deal, we might waive that. We usually do. If we see it's a default judgment where wife and a, where wife signs the petition, files it, serves the husband by substitute service because he's an equitor. We don't really know if he gets notice and divorces him af after a wait of 180 days, divorces him in absentia. He never even shows up to the court. We might wait out that 30-day appeal period because he might just show up and say, hey, I don't want to be divorced or I don't like the division of community property that I didn't do. But generally... If it's to get divorced, and that can change everything. Now, sometimes divorces have things in them that impose requirements. They might say, oh, wife gets the property, but she has to pay $190,000 to the husband within 10 days of signing this decree. The title company wants to see that happen. They might even collect the 190 at closing and pay it to the other spouse in exchange for a release of all their interest. Because believe it or not, when a divorce decree is set up where property is awarded to one spouse, the other spouse pays for it, the law says that that's actually like a type of vendor's lien. That's a lien in the real estate that will screw up the title. We don't deal with it. So we look at divorces and make sure that, that all money that is owed for the transfer of that property is paid out of the foreclosure. So at what point is the filing of the divorce and the divorce decree public? It's well, the, the county clerks have, and the and the divorce, the court system in general has gotten more private recently. Uh, but unless you file under seal, I think um, as as soon as a day or two after filing, that divorce petition is available to, to look at if you want to. So when they file for divorce, that goes into public it record. Goes into a public record. Every filing of a, of a lawsuit or a probate or a divorce or a child custody arrangement or a, or a property tax lawsuit of any kind is, is filed in public records. You can go down to the county clerk, and if you know where to look, and you can request a copy of it. You might pay a per-page price, but you can get a copy of it. Republic is always looking at divorces and lawsuits and things like that, and we have a search service that does that for us. And retrieves them. We can go look at a divorce that's 50 years old if we have to. Might take a while. So, so what well, might come out of a divorce situation? Court may get involved because the parties can't agree on everything and they may appoint a receiver. Let's talk about receivers. <laughs> what is a receiver? And then I need to turn it over to Kelly to talk. Uh, a receiver is a court appointee. It's someone that, that a court, usually a divorce court, although there are receiverships for creditor actions when creditors are owed so much money that they want the court to appoint them to take over a business so that you can get the profits and the revenues for your debt. That's much more rare. Most of the time, a receivership is done in a divorce proceeding where the two co-owners can't agree on what to do. And their squabbling is causing the valuable resource, which is the, the home, let's say, to be wasted. It's deteriorating in value or it's losing market value. It needs to be sold. And so one of the two spouses will say, you know what? I want the court to appoint a receiver. And the receiver for a temporary, temporary period of time becomes the legal owner of that property and has powers over it and can sell it perhaps against the will of the parties, although that's a, that's a deeper matter there. And so one of the things that we sometimes see in receivership is that receivership can shatter and destroy real estate brokerage arrangements. You can have a husband who has listed a property with a broker, let's say Keller Williams, and the wife 
says, I don't agree with that broker. They don't know what to price it at. The wife gets a receiver appointed. The receiver is appointed and the receiver goes, well, we don't have any contract with Keller Williams. We're going to hire a different broker. And that can sometimes happen. But sometimes the receiver wants you to help them and wants you to list the property and help them sell it. So the receiver might be an agent, though. <clears throat> a receiver is often a broker. Uh, not always. Um, and you might be asked to be appointed as a receiver. Um, let me advise you, after having watched Eleanor, my receipts, I'm going to say that quickly there. She <laughs> out Watch her get sued for millions being a receiver at a Republic title closing. By very angry people. So unless you adjust your listing agreement to say, I will be paid X percent commission, plus you will pay my attorney's fee that I have to hire for my attorney to guard me to be a receiver. You'll pay me both of those things. I would not agree to be a receiver. I would not agree for you to be a receiver without your own independent counsel. Don't rely on the title company's attorneys to protect you. The thing about receivership is that it is often in a period of hate, contest, conflict. You may have one party that wants to sell and one that doesn't. And the one that doesn't want to sell will lash out at everybody in the transaction, perhaps with attorneys and lawsuits saying, you you, this is all a conspiracy to steal my home away from me. Even though it's all done pursuant to court action, it's all legal and authorized. So be very, very weary of being a receiver. I'm not saying you couldn't, but most real estate brokers that agree to be receivers do not have their own counsel. They're just flying by the seat of their pants. I can see Mike going, he's just scared. That <laughs> so if we, do, if we do have a receiver and it's the agent, uh, what shows up in the contract in paragraph one? Well, legally, the receiver would, would be the selling party. Bob Baker, comma, duly appointed court receiver for Charles Kramer and Rick Kramer, who are divorced. You would literally be the seller. You would literally sign the contract. Now, because Republic Title has had claims experience, bad claims experience that has reformed their view, and other title companies, to be honest, haven't, and they may be a little more loose or naive about this stuff, Republic looks at it this way. If the receivership is because the husband and wife are arguing over the split of the money, which is the most common situation. They can't agree on 50-50. We can close a receivership because we will require that the husband and wife sign the deed. Look, you'll agree to the sale. We're just going to hold the money in escrow for a period of time, let's say 180 days or 90 days or 120, a short period of time, until you guys agree. And if you don't agree, we're going to take all the net proceeds and put it into the divorce court. You guys can continue to litigate that for years and years if you want. That's a doable, closable situation where you don't have much risk because even though you're signing as receiver, Republic is behind you going, yeah, and husband and wife will also sign the documents too to evidence their consent to the sale. The scenario you don't want to do is you're the a receiver and one spouse wants to sell and the other one says, I will die in the home first. I am not selling. Believe it or not, Republic actually had a closing that was that situation and the closer, not in Kelly's office, uh, said, well, I'll come out. The, the, the husband was just a jerk the whole time, rude to everybody, rude to the agent, uncooperative, would say he wasn't going to sign documents, look like, and finally at the last minute, conceded, said, fine, come to the house Saturday at 9 a.m., and I'll sign the documents. And the closer opened the door at 9 a.m., it was unlocked, and he had blown his brain out. He took a long leave of absence. Came back, but that's, when one wants to sell and one doesn't, you just, I, I think the most prudent thing is instead of being a receiver and trying to make the deal work against the wishes of one of the owners of the property, you should say, you guys contact me when you're together on this issue, when you're both in agreement to sell. 
And the funny thing about that answer is if they're both in agreement, so they don't need a receiver. So receivership sales are rare. Be very careful about them and certainly never do them when the, the crux of the receivership is whether to sell or not. If the, if the crux of the receivership is I want more money, we can, we can find a way around that. We can, you can, your good efforts will give them money to argue about. And that usually overcome, greed overcomes all. You know, it's like, do you want money to fight about? Because if you can't agree, we're not selling the house and there's nothing there. Okay, that delightful story. Now I <laughs> hand it over to Kelly. He's talked about any, it. any final questions on sellers and how you sign all those kinds of things? Great I have a you to get the great expertise here. You think before we have Kelly come up and talk to us about how in the heck we're going to make sure we don't keep screwing up on the tax prorations? Is there any, um, I'm just curious, is there any talk at the state level about? Uh, ID requirements because it's unusual to have pass ID. We have every right to. I um, I, uh, I I passed a message to my good friend Vanessa Burgess, who's the general counsel of Trek, and told her how the title companies are on fire with this. That fraud is everywhere. It's around every corner. And shouldn't it be a basic standard of practice for brokers? Would you consider writing a rule that maybe a broker has to check ID? Not for entities. I think that gets too complicated. Yes. But when you're dealing with a human being, I think that a, you should, even if it isn't in the law yet, I think you should get an ID. Wow, I really do. And I think it should be written in the law. And the response was, we're talking about this right now. Now, Trek moves very slowly. So you might see something a year from now when all the seller fraud has died down. But I think, I, I hope that, that there is a rule written that will require every agent that's listing with a human being to procure their ID in some manner. This will, however, require an act of the legislature. Yeah. Yeah. The, so we've got a uh, process. Shabina, Shabina has, um, okay, Shabina has, has a question. Yeah. Yes, hi. Thank you. I have a question. It's regarding the previous one. It's about the uh, living trust. So is, is the seller is a family living trust. So I'm going to make an offer. So it's over there. It's only ring the family living trust name. So am I supposed to write comma and the person's name? There is no person's name. There's only the trust. So would be the seller would be only the trust family no, trust. That doesn't change anything. You just have a lack of information. So you should, if you really want to do things, best practices is call the listing agent that you want to make an offer and say, "Can I get the name of the trustee of this trust?" And okay, usually... I can see the uh, in the tax roll. It's only the uh, the family trust name. I know. But You're gonna have to get more information. I to... see. Yeah. Okay, I will do that. And also, it goes. This, is that the same as LLC? So when no. the buyer is an LLC, so do I only write the LLC name Correct. and buy sign or the, the you buyer? Don't need the... To write an offer to buy an LLC's property, you do not need to know the parties that sign it. Okay. So you just need the LLC name. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Shavina. All right. Sure. Come on. Thank you. Can we take a so they can clean tag a little bit to work through this? Kelly, thank you very much. This is Kelly Wall, and she's, they used to be right across the way in in. in over to, to be in here. Yeah, that's true. You <laughs> did. Yeah. And then way back when, and then they moved.
now it's not really worded quite the same. Um, and the title company wants to do what's best and fair for both sides, but do know that it really is a matter between the buyer and the seller. Y'all can decide to prorate however you want as long as it's an agreement. This is like perfect time because tax season is one month away, our favorite time of year. Um, so if you own a home, you know our property tax bills come out in October, and that is when we find out how much our taxes are. So for the majority of the year, we don't know what the property tax bill is going to be, which means we are having to kind of estimate how the taxes are going to get prorated. And what we typically do um, early in the year, we use the previous year's tax figures. That's the fairest way to do it. That's the most um, it, the best information that we have at the time. Every January, the tax assessor goes out and assesses what they think the property's worth. The homeowner gets notified in April of what that proposed value is going to be. So now when those values come out in April, we have a really good idea of what that current year's taxes are going to be. They don't certify those till July, but we can use that amount just this last year, if you, you're a homeowner, you got your certifications and how high did they go up this year? Mm -hmm. um, not a pleasant thing, but if we were using last year's taxes, which a lot of title companies do, they, they will just look at last year's taxes. They won't look at the assessed value for this year um, and prorate off that. We look at the 2023 value because it's really not fair to a buyer. It, the information that's out there, not to use that to prorate for this year. Um, and I think that's a fair. So remember, there is a clause in the contract that says when the tax bill comes out, the buyer and the seller you shall. Read it. <laughs> they, I can't see. Oh. <laughs> they Never mind. Never mind. shall re prorate. That means they will. They, it's, it's, if the seller refuses to, the buyer can file suit, but it already specifies in the contract. So if you have somebody that's super anxious um, about using the previous year's figures, the seller's adamant, he doesn't want to use this year's, you might just remind them that, okay, that's fine. But remember, you're, you're a party to this contract, you signed it, and you've agreed to reprorate when the bills come out. I've seen people reprorate for like less than $20 before. That's not normal. Um, there's not a lot of reprorating done, but I su suspect this year it might be a different issue. And for a couple of reasons. Last year, they, well, this is the first year that they allowed you to move your homestead exemption during the year. And this is such a huge problem. Um, if you have, I'll just give y'all a little scenario that I'm dealing with right now. We closed the cellar. It was down in Dallas. And, like the $2 million house. The seller said he was leaving his exemption in place. Um, so we prorated using the 2020, that year's value, last year's value. Um, he moved into his new house. He actually had moved into his new house a year before that. And he did take his exemption with him, although he said he wasn't going to. Dallas company went back the previous two years and took off the homestead exemption and sent out a supplemental bill for $20,000. Now, this is where it gets complicated. The buyer's lender got the delinquent tax bill and paid the delinquent taxes for <laughs> the buyer's supplemental bill. So, of course, who do you think gets the phone call? Um, I get the phone call. Everybody's irate. The agents are upset and the seller swore under oath that he wasn't taking that exemption, but somebody told him, look, you can take this exemption. You can take it to your new property, save all this money. And he took it retroactively. And he did. Um, so you having conversations with your customers is really important and intent, explain that to the title company. We will work with your clients. We'll tell them the best way that we think to keep their exemptions or move it or not will be. You don't even have to take that on yourselves. We'll be happy to do it. We have a little form we send out when we uh, receive the contract and we ask them up front, what do you intend to do? 
call us if you don't know what to do or you have questions about it. We always ask them if they're going to take an exemption with them because now if you move your, if you're closing right now and you're buying a new home, it's not going to be a great idea to take that exemption to a new property because most of the year is gone. If they move it to a new property, it falls off the current property for the entire year. It's not prorated like it used to be. So, and if the house that they're purchasing has the exemption on there and that person, that seller is moving out of state, they're going to get the benefit of that person's exemption anyways for the rest of the year. So this is the first year that we've had to really think about what people were doing. Um, and I've literally called the seller of two sales down to find out what they're doing so we can make sure that everybody's saving money. Nobody likes to get that supplemental bill at the end of the year, find out the taxes weren't prorated. Um, but I suspect y'all are going to get a lot of that this year. You're going to get a lot of phone calls. We won't release private information out to anybody. So unfortunately, when that reprorating happens, we have to encourage them to call their agent who has to get in touch with the other agent. So you're going to be getting involved in this um, and just calm everybody down, remind them that they, the contract tells us what to do. It's already been agreed to. Uh, the parties have already agreed to reprorate and look, it could go the other way around this year. Um, I don't know, Charles, do you know that if they vote for this? Exemption? Well, it's done. It's a done deal. I don't know the, the, when it takes effect. Maybe it takes effect for next year's taxes. I don't know if they're going to apply it to this year if it's too late in the calendar already. Well, the bills but will have already gone out. Yeah. I said I have two, two quick questions. Yeah. On the exemptions that move, mm -hmm. how about senior exemptions? Is that, senior exemptions also move and create the same problem? Could. Generally, that will stay on the property, but they are allowed to take it to a new property but it gets prorated. So they get to keep it for however long they own this property and then it drops off when they sell, moves to the new property, and then they keep it for the time they own that new property. Okay, my second question is more for Bob. Six months after the closing, when this comes up and agents get notified, usually you say it's a buyer-seller issue, agents should stay out of it. Is that the same in this scenario? Yes, it is. That's why you have the conversation, the things that Kelly's talking about, having the conversation when they start fussing about it, who to blame, it's not us because we gave them the information so they can make decisions. So because like in your case, you just talked about, that falls over and it hits on who, the buyer? Well, it depends. I mean, the, the it just, when, when that, if it's a supplemental tax bill that happens, like they moved an exemption. I don't want to say that we're... Here's here. the reality of it. Is that, <laughs> yeah. Just as that is the, that is your standard response. Yes, we're not involved. Contact the other party. The title company, Republic Title, and every title company makes both buyer and seller sign this piece of paper that says if there is a a, a dispute or a misunderstanding or an adjustment of the prorations, y'all will not involve us. And you'll deal with it. And guess what? Just like your attempts to push it off fail always, our piece of paper fails all the time. Kelly gets drug into this stuff. So the reality of it is, yes, the initial answer is you need to work that out with the other party. The reality is you may get drug back into it just because that's just what people do. They don't let you go. And so Kelly's going to have to end up dealing with this, even though they sign a piece of paper that says, I'll never bother Kelly again. I promise. <laughs> they do. They do. That's the reality of it. I want to make sure that I understand the elements of this, of the prorations, and how they're going to be affected during the year of the new law, so so that we can make sure our client that we've given good information. You know what? Here's what could happen. You know, so so you can negotiate this contract, with the seller however you want to, based on what could happen. And, and this can always happen because, like I said, some people at closing they don't they're moving into an apartment. They're not going to take their exemption. Well, that could be early in the year and three months later, oh, they find a house, they go buy it, and they obviously apply for an exemption on it. That may not have been their intent. So when I get that phone call that, you know, that here I just got my tax bill and this seller owes me $4,000 more. Uh, 
Um, I just, I always point out a paragraph 13 in the contract. I explained to them, we don't, we didn't have the tax bills at the time. This was the best information that we had that we used. Um, and the seller is obligated to pay the difference. The buyer is obligated to pay the difference if they go down. It's it, they have both already agreed to this in the contract. And generally you have people that are not horrible about it. They understand that one that I, the lady went back for $20, the seller just middle finger up and <laughs> said, no, yeah, so, yeah, I'm not going to do it. it. And, I, and I don't blame them, but it, you generally don't see it unless it's large amounts of money. But if you know that the seller is going to buy another house right. and there's any question about whether he's going to take an exemption with him, let the title company know so we can have that conversation because you will get drug into the middle of this when the bill comes out if you don't. So before we get to Sally's question, one of our challenges here, it's a balancing act because we want them to know here's what could happen. But if you go too far with that, they get paranoid about yeah. making new decisions because it might not happen. They will, what do you mean? How do I know if it's going to happen or not? Here's a so speech I might suggest. I might suggest that you talk, whether you're representing a seller or buyer, because prorations are an adjustment to both sides. And you say to them before the closing, say, all right, I want to tell you what little I know about prorations. Prorations, which are an allocation of taxes that haven't come out yet, are the title company's best guess at what the bill is going to be. They're going to do their best. And I encourage you to look at the, the guess, look at the estimate, Talk to Kelly and her team about how they created it, because you might learn something interesting. She might say, you know, we didn't take last year's taxes and divide by 365. I didn't feel that was fair because taxes went up so much year to year that we actually took this year's value against last year's tax rates. And that's the formula we use for courage. And that's my best guess. And you, your, your seller or your buyer gets a comfort level. And then you say, now, even in spite of that best guess, sometimes facts change, and those facts can change after closing. If, for example, the seller that you're buying it from messes with their exemptions, they, they post-closing take an exemption that was on the property with them, which they are entitled by law to do and we can't do anything, that's going to change the numbers. That's going to, that's going to mean that your taxes that actually come out are going to be different than the best guess we did at closing. Here's what I want you to take away. The contract allows you, whether you're a seller or buyer, to true up after closing. So if the bills come out and you've run the numbers against the proration guess on the closing statement, my hands represent closing statements, um, you can go back against the seller if you can find them. Yeah. Uh, and you can even sue them if you really want to. You know, it's, it's a guaranteed winning lawsuit there. And we've seen it happen. But... But bottom line is the title company will do their best to get as close as they can, as close a guess as they can, subject to facts changing. We can't do anything about the facts, but that's that's the best I can tell you. And there's a true up mechanism to make it, you know, if you really feel like you're ripped off. Now, if the difference is a hundred bucks, maybe you want to eat that. You know, maybe you don't want to go chase a seller for a hundred dollars there. But the, the most common reason that that true up mechanism is used is when last year the tax values were on a piece of raw land, a builder was hammering on it, and the home got finished in, let's say, the middle of the year, you're closing, and the title company is not Republican. The title company is dumb A title company, and they just... They just follow a formula. We just take last year, we divide by 365. Last year was a lot value, so um, I'm real sorry. You know, And that can be dangerous if you're dealing with the builder contract because a lot of those contracts will not allow for repro. They don't true up. They'll say the prorations are final. And the buyer comes to you and says, I got $800 credit and my damn tax bill was $18,000. How did that happen? Well, the title company we used used last year's values. They were land only, so you didn't get as much credit. But uh, sad to say, your contract, which I'm not an expert in because it's a builder contract, does not allow the true up that's in the track. All these bad news things there. So it's important to understand how prorations work, that they are a guess. The TREC contract has that very powerful true up mechanism in it. 
that other contracts don't. And what we haven't mentioned is REO deals and RELO deals often have addenda that close the books. You know, the last thing that a RELO seller wants, a RELO company, they don't want a buyer coming to them six months after they close their books on the asset and go, oh, you owe me $1,500. So they will say, regardless of what the TREC contract says, prorations are final. That makes it even more imperative that the title company's best guess be as accurate as possible because there's no second chance after closing. Or, you know, we had one with the seller that um, he was disputing his, and so he was adamant that we use last year's, which is fine, but, you know, the buyer had to agree to it too. They had to come to some sort of comfort level um, where they agreed to what formula we were going to use to, and I love that because I can just say, look, here is just what you agree to. I think if you're a buyer and you're feeling pressured by an insistent seller who says, no, we're not going to prorate on that logical basis Kelly came up with. We're going to prorate on this lower amount. Your response can be fine. You know that my buyer is going to come find you after closing for the difference. Are you aware of that? What? Yeah, that's in the contract. Read paragraph 13. You may be cutting off your nose to spike your face. If you really want to go down this route, we can. But we, I guarantee you my buyer is going to true up after it's all over. So you decide what you want to do. And sometimes those sellers go... Fine, and they give in and they do a more accurate proration because they don't want to be bothered after quotes. This really comes into play at the very beginning of the year, usually last year. I mean, we're talking about a few months. Um, it's even if it increased dramatically, it's not going to be. Small fraction yeah. There's one other thing I want to mention about prorations that isn't involved in the sale of houses so much, but sometimes with new construction condos or land, let's, let's say that you are buying five acres out of 20 acres and the tax account is on 20 acres. So not only does Kelly have to do a proration guess as to what the future taxes will be, she has to apportion it as to five acres. So she's gonna use math and say, okay, five acres out of 20, that's 25% of the bill, I can do that. And she prorates, and the classic proration in a sale is to presume that the buyer is going to get the tax bill. And if the buyer is going to get the tax bill, then the buyer should, at the closing, receive a credit from January 1st to the date of closing. And likewise, the seller should receive a debit. That's their portion of the year that they own the property. And she does that. And guess what happens? The bill doesn't go to the buyer. The bill goes to the seller. The tax account for the subdivision of land, Central Appraisal District will tell you, will take another calendar year to turn. And the seller pays the bill, and suddenly the buyer's going, wait a minute. Or the seller is angry, going, I paid the whole bill, and now I got to chase the buyer for their portion of their taxes. And on top of that, I gave credit at closing. So it's incumbent on the agents and the title company to recognize when you might need to do a reverse proration. When the bill is not going to go to the buyer, it might go to the seller, for example. And we have done that. And I have complicated reverse proration agreements where the parties say, you know what? Buyer will credit seller at closing for their anticipated portion of the bill. And seller, when they get the bill after closing, agrees to pay it. We've had that. Yeah. But that takes an awareness of the agent to bring an attorney into it. Yes. Read that language. Where does that happen? That happens most often subdivision of land. And I would say not new home construction. That's so simple. But when you are taking land and creating 100 condo units and suddenly you're going from one tax account to 100 tax accounts, that might take another calendar year to turn to create those accounts. Does the buyer and the seller get the specific accounting of how to get yes. up? With the yes. At least at Republic, they actually have not on that don't bother us page underneath it says, and you agree this is how we calculated it. And Kelly has the, she's got like five options, one of which is to use last year's values, one of which is to take the current year's values and apply against the sales price, 
one of which is to use some figure agreed between the parties. You know, they could agree between themselves there. So. Well, and do the parties have to disclose how to contact each other as part of that form? No, they don't. That's the hard part. That's that's where she talks about private information. So you are a buyer. You want 4000 bucks to true up the taxes after closing. You've got to use the good old Google and Internet to go find. And you may, you know, logically, you're going to contact your agent, the buyer's agent, who's going to contact the listing agent. And the listing agent might not return a phone call. Or the listing agent might return a phone call and say, I don't know where my seller is. Or the listing agent might say, yeah, the seller's address is whatever, go get them. You know, who knows what kind of range of answers, but, but chasing down a seller, some of which move out of state, move to China, you don't know. You know, that's the other thing is that even if you have a remedy in the track contract, if your seller is not local, it's not much of a remedy. Sally, did you have a question? Or well, Andrew? No, I had a uh an observation you just blew me away with that i'm so glad i don't have any land deals going on. <laughs> but this is very complicated now it used to not be so and uh i don't remember ever and maybe i should have been but ever being so concerned about prorations as i am now and you may have the scenario where you have not only the seller but he's also a buyer He's with different That's title right. company now let's and you don't know how that other title company is doing things or have the same relationship or confidence that you have. If, if it makes you feel any better, remember we started with the idea that a proration is a guess. It's our best guess. Most prorations do not match the actual bills that come out at the end of the year. And I will say that most buyers, even though they get ripped off to the tune of a few hundred bucks on the prorations, for the past 25 years have not contacted their agent or they in fact they don't even know they don't even realize this stuff so yeah, it's only a big deal when you're talking big numbers and big differences well, and, and i agree with you but my, my point was going to be that this year because our yeah. tax our taxes have gone crazy it's going to be weird. it's going to be scary this year yeah. and it's hard enough for us to try to understand it the title company and now we're in a virtual world and i've seen literally clients down at a table agree to do a virtual close with no one on the phone with them. Yeah. They're signing papers. And they, they do that. And yeah. well, that's frightening to me. I know. It is, it is scary. But like I had this one with an agent in this office where her people came to closing and they had an over 65 extension on the property. Well, they walk in my door, sit down, nice to meet you. I'm like, Where's the over 65 person? Um, these people were clearly not anywhere near over 65. And they've been in the house for six years. And getting that exemption for six years. Um, it was it, an uncomfortable situation, but it had to be addressed. And was it people, still going on because the previous people qualified? And it yes. Never came off. Never the, came off the appraisal district. For whatever reason, missed it. They missed that D fund. They don't usually miss stuff like that, but they did. And it was about twenty-seven thousand um, that the that we ended up having to pay at closing. They did not charge any penalties because it was their error. But those sellers knew that they were getting that exemption for all those years, and it's their responsibility to contact the appraisal district and say, "Look, I'm getting this. I know they don't want to." And it caught up with them. If you're listing real estate and it's got an over 65 exemption on tax rates, and the people you're talking to are 30, <laughs> think about do we have a problem? Now we see that like sometimes we'll have somebody died the previous year, that exemption is still showing on the property. Maybe it didn't do anything with the appraisal district. Um, I will always look to see when that person died. I know those exemptions are not going to apply this year if they died last year. And so I will not use last year's amounts. I prorate without any exemptions on the property. It's just simple for me. But I don't know what other title companies do. I know a lot of title companies will only look at the previous year's figures. Um, but like the last couple of years, because the values have gone up, I've always used the appraised notice unless I know they're disputing them. And I've had like one or two people in the last two years have to reprogram. Um, it really helps. The better yeah. the guess, the less chance you're going to be bothered by. When the buyer's agent is helping the buyer determine what their taxes are going to be, 
And one of the things that we've learned the hard way is don't ever look at what's an MLS. What should we be looking at to help our buyer uh, determine what the best guess is for taxes? Well, appraisal notices, appraisal information is all public. You can get on any county's um, site and see what the appraisal amount is for that current year. And it'll list the tax rates too. So yeah. you can take the appraised value for the current year, multiply, and the tax rates. The first thing that happens in the tax calendar and the tax rules get solidified in July and you get the appraisal rule. So all the values get determined first in the calendar year. Then the, the government starts setting their budgets. They have these budget workshops in July and August. And right now you're seeing headlines in the news about Dallas sets its tax rate at whatever. That happens in August. And so the tax rates come out in August. Appraisals are, you know, earlier in July or, but, you know, they're proposed as early as, as April. So well, what's the conversation we have about exemptions as we're looking at the value and the rate? Well, I always our... tell people this too, because I, if you have an elderly person and they have an over 65, don't just assume that the title company is going to give them the best information either. Have them call the appraisal district. The appraisal district will tell them, look, this is going to be your best thing. Leave it here. Move it here. But let them have that conversation with the, even my 90-year-old people understand what the appraisal district is explaining to them. Um, they, that's what I would suggest. And then make sure it gets relayed to your title company on what their intent is um, so it, it's handled correctly. I have a question. You know, people want to treat an exemption with them. That only applies in the state of Texas. Right? It, it is. Like homestead is only for Texas. So if they're moving out of state, then it's going to stay on the property for the remainder of the okay. year. Yeah. It's, only it's the only reason it's confusing because they're allowing people to do it in the middle of the year. And before it was just what it, it was. It used to be yeah. opposite. And that's why it's hard now. Yeah, yeah it used to be opposite. It stayed on the property for the year. The over 65 was the one that we worried about right. because that one didn't. Now they're reversed. Um, yeah, because you can't, but you can only, it only moves to a new property if that new property does not have an exemption on the property. So there might be no reason for somebody to apply for it this year. If it's a chain reaction sort of thing, seller to buyer to seller to buyer, and every seller is living in the house as their homestead, there's no, they're going to, the buyer is going to get the seller's homestead exemption. It just carries, there's no reason for them to port it to the new property. But don't they have to, they did have to reapply for it next year. Next year. Okay. Yeah, in January, January, like they normally would. Yeah. 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 Too. And, and to make it even more fun, all of these stories, these horror stories are multiplied when you consider that lenders are escrowing for taxes. They're using these proration figures for their escrows. And when you get a massive supplemental bill or whatever, then they pay it and then they've got a rebound on the payment amount. And you, we've even seen instances where monies that are supposed to go to the seller get refunded by the lender to their buyer and they're chasing the money. It's are a huge, they're a constant struggle for time. Or if you get a buyer that, you know, especially an inexperienced buyer that doesn't understand that they're going to get the tax bill at the end of the year. They're, if they didn't escrow, they're going to pay the whole tax bill at the end of the year. Sometimes they don't know that. Sometimes you'll see a lender that uses the previous year's figures to escrow taxes for the next year and that this exemption is not going to be on the property and your buyer is going to be five six thousand dollars short in their escrow account i want them to know that at closing look this is what you have to prepare for yeah. it's just it's not a nice place to be at the end of the year if you find out good news all of this makes this most harder <laughs> yes. It makes your job, it's job security because it requires trained professionals. Yeah. Any questions? Bob, did we cover what you wanted to cover? Oh, uh, we, we did on this thing. And by it's on the Zoom, our Paris agent, she's talking about one that I mentioned earlier about sellers at five sellers and power of attorney. And she was just giving me additional information. Um, no probate, parents have transferred to the children's name. 
for 17 years. One of the children had power of attorney for mother. Mother passed away. As you mentioned earlier, the power of attorney goes away. So I'm not sure in this case, and she may need to talk to one of you, what the situation is for her sellers. So by you probably need to, to talk to Charles or tell him you got Charles's numbers earlier to find out based on what you know, what you have to do in the way of listing in the contract, dealing with your multiple seller situation. We'll figure it out. Yeah, so give me a call and they'll, uh, they'll help you figure that out because it's, uh, yeah. And, and I guess one of the things that I, that I hope that comes out of you know, both Charles and Kelly's conversation, especially Kelly's deal with all these tax issues, is your job is to make sure you can provide them good information, but you don't know anything. Everything you get is from somewhere else. Remember yep. my favorite phrase? We don't know anything. Everything right. is from somewhere else. So you're going to say, here's where you go. You're going to guide them. Here's where you're getting their information. Here's what you're going to do. Because uh, we don't know. It. Because, and I understand I've got a bias because I deal with the issues every day. It's like you deal with the issues every day. If if you make a statement in such a way that they now hold you responsible, it's wrong, we're going to have to cut a check. And we screwed up. We're going to have that responsibility. I'm going to just check your chats because you got a few on here. Okay. So but I also just had one that popped up and she just wants you to repeat your phone numbers. Please. My phone numbers are office 214 387 4591, cell 214 766 0151. Any answers on weekends? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So appreciate his help. As you work through and it. How many years have you been working in the diet business? You're not that old. No, this is <laughs> I was gonna say this is gonna be a lot, a lot of years. 30. All right. So she wow. started when she was zero. <laughs> and we love her. She's just so good. So anything in the chat? No, I think we addressed the so there were some audio issues and there was the question about the phone. Okay, all right. Okay. Well, so the big thing is take this information on how to guide your clients moving through it. And we'll get my hand. Yeah. Thank you guys for being here. Hey, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.